Okay, we're going to begin our evening service with our song, God to God Be the Glory. Uh, please feel free to hum along, sing along as we uh, do our opening song. To God be the glory, great things he has Crisis or surviving a terrible crisis, 
We say that there is a preparation that needs to take place. Amen. And uh, this preparation is actually uh, in uh, three ways. We study the Word of God, we pray, and then we serve God. And uh, once these things are taken care of, we don't wonder if we're going to be prepared or not. You know, oftentimes we've asked ourselves the question, say, am I ready for Jesus? Do I love Jesus? But it is interesting that love develops as you pray, as you read the Word of God, as you serve Him. Uh, we have a saying, I speak uh, my mother tongue, but I also have another language, French, and I've realized that some of you speak French. It's the family here. Yeah, you speak French, don't you? A little bit, okay. Uh, we, we say, actually, loin des yeux, loin du coeur. When one is far from your eyes, it is very hard for you to connect and have him as a friend. Because you tend to forget, right? But when you are always together in the process, you even end up falling in love, even though you didn't love one another before. Because you're always together, right? Have you actually wondered why a uh, 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 not couple, a married couple, when they get old, they tend to look alike? In their 70s or 80s, you will look at them and wonder and ask the old man, say, did you marry your sister? Or you ask them, did you marry your brother? Because you look alike. Why? Because you've lived together. Every time the husband smiled, you smiled. You responded with a smile. Every time he got angry, you weren't happy either, right? And so in the process, when he does this, you do this, and do this, you do this. And then in the process, you realize, oh, we're just doing the same thing. We are just the same. And this is what happens when we read the Word of God. Because that's where we find Jesus. Amen? Amen. That's where you hear him speaking and you learn to utter his tone and, and his voice and his words. They are part of you. Amen? And without, before you realize it, you are just who you are supposed to be, a Christian. And uh, I've always compared this to eating, actually. Uh, when you eat, you don't know what is happening. You just eat. And then the next day you eat, and then the next day you eat, and you eat, and you eat. Sometimes you are even spoon-fed, like my son, and, and then they force you, but you eat. As long as you are eating, something is going to take place. You just add some weight on, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, then you, uh, well, there was a time I was only 50 kilograms, and I used to eat, and I went on the scale, because I wanted to have some more weight, and the next morning, I just found myself 50 kilograms and I kept eating. But now I think I'm a little bit more than that. Amen? What am I saying here? Ladies and gentlemen, that's what happens even when we eat the spiritual food. You just eat and the rest, God takes care of it. You read the word of God. You pray. Amen? Amen. And you serve God. Then you will fall in love with Him. And so uh, I talked about prayer very much about prayer this morning. I talked about uh, studying the Word of God, the Bible that my sister gave me, and I will, I talked about serving God, but I think today I will talk about something else. Now, uh, Martin Luther says that to be a Christian without prayer is no more possible than to be alive without breathing. Mm -hmm. If I can survive without breathing, physically, and I will definitely not be able to survive without uh, eating, uh, praying, spiritually speaking. And uh, uh, now I am going to continue with my story. Uh, and this story takes place in a, in, a, in a place where life was so miserable. But before I continue with my story, uh, you know, there's this quote uh, uh, which says that hope means hoping when things are hopeless. 
And that is what faith is all about. Faith is faith when things are unbelievable. Because if you can still see evidences of faith, then that is not faith at all, right? Amen. And so, uh, allow me to talk about this. Talking about serving God, I want to tell you that there is something that is taking place right now among those who love Jesus. And what is that? My remote somehow is not behaving well. Uh, when you go to the book of uh, Revelation, chapter 6, what do we have in chapter 6? Uh, we have the sixth seal. Oh, what is this? Maybe I need another remote because the one I had in the morning didn't have any problem. And uh, the sixth chapter of the book of Revelation, from verse 14 it reads, Then the sky receded. Uh, as a scroll, when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the sky receded as a scroll when it's rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. And the king of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains. What is this picture describing? The coming of Jesus Christ, right? Mm -hmm. But before he comes, there is the opening of the sixth seal, right? And when this seal is opened, remember there are only seven seals. Now the sixth seal is this, uh, the sixth seal which takes place before this happens. There is the darkening of the sun, there is the falling of the stars, maybe the shooting stars, and uh, there is also the moon becoming black. All right? Now, these things, as we know, we know historically that they took place from 1755, right? When there were these earthquakes of uh, uh, Lisbon, and then there was uh, the darkening of the sun in 18, uh, 1780. And then there was the falling of the meteors in 1833. Now, these things were uh, telling us that Jesus is coming. Why the interesting verse 18 ends with the falling of the star? And you wonder, why did Jesus not come immediately in 1833? Or at least 1844, when the Adventist people were waiting for Jesus to come. Why did he not come? The reason is in verse 14, right? Verse 14 says the sky receded. Wait a minute. The reason is not in verse 6. Why did verse 14 not come to fulfillment immediately after the falling of the sky? Why did Jesus not come? The reason you will find it on the, in the next chapter, which is actually Revelation chapter 7, verse 1, where the, then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees, till we have sealed the servants of God. What is going on here? Jesus should have come, but then, uh, and the people of God should go to heaven, but they, Jesus realized that there are people who need to be sealed. Who needs to get prepared before that? All the signs have come to fulfill them, but I have to do something. I've got to seal my people. Amen? And so he says, wait a minute, hold on. There are four angels holding the four winds uh, from the four corners of the earth. And you know the winds represent the walls, the tribulation. But before that takes place, there is a command. Please don't do that. Don't let the wind blow on the trees or the sea until we have sealed the God's people, right? And after they are sealed, if you go to the last, the next chapter, what do you realize? Revelation chapter 8 from verse 1 it says, When you open the seventh seal, which is the last, there was a silence in heaven for half an hour. And what is this silence? Jesus in heaven, he comes, does he come alone when he comes to, to, to take us home? He comes with all the angels. And so who is in angels praising? Because all the praises are in the air. Jesus is coming to take us home. Amen? 
And that's why there's a silence of a half an hour. And prophetically, a half an hour is actually seven days. Amen? Because prophetically, one day is one hour. I mean, uh, one day is one year. And the day, how many, well, let's, let's do some mathematics. Some. One day, one year. How many hours in one day here? 24. 24. How many days in one year? 360. No, 365, we don't have it in the Bible. That's recent, okay? That's recent, not biblical. In the Bible, only a month is 30, okay? Now, uh, so you have 24 equals 360. So, 1, 360 divided by 24. What do you have? I'm not going to ask you to do that, okay? No, you, you don't. Uh, we used to do this in the past, but not today. Amen? So that's going to be 15. One hour, 15 days, prophetically. Half an hour, 15 divided by 2. So we are still on the seventh day, not the eighth yet. There was a silence of a half an hour. And that's where uh, you will hear some people saying that we will take seven days of travel to heaven. Is it going to be too long as we journey with Jesus going to heaven? Amen? Is it going to be too long? No, because we are talking about billions and billions of, of, of kilometers. Because, well, the nearest star, which is outside the Milky, uh, no, outside the Milky, Milky Way. Galaxy, Milky Way. How do we call it? I think Proxima the Century, right? In Proxima the Century, it's at uh, two, uh, for, for us to be able to reach there, if we would fly at the speed of the light. 300,000 kilometers per second. Every second. Uh, you've turned around the earth 10 times, 8 times. If you would fly at that speed, it will take us 243,000 years for us to reach there. And we are talking about a neighbor star just close to our galaxy. And we have billions and billions of galaxies. Now, it will only take us 7 days to reach heaven. Amen? Where does God live? I don't know, maybe right in the center of the universe. Now, I don't want to teach you the prophecy. I only want to tell you, uh, we're talking about the ceiling. What is going on right now is the ceiling of God's people. Preparation. We need to be sealed. Amen? And uh, if you, uh, for instance, go, uh, I'm not going to go through this, but the book of Ezekiel talks about, again, uh, someone who had uh, a need uh, uh, and he was sealing God's people and the people who were being sealed actually, the Bible says that uh, those now the glory uh, when they go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and cry over all the abominations that are done within it while the people being sealed those who are crying and weeping over the evil that are being committed on this planet here. You may not be able to stop that, you may not even know how to preach, but at least you are sighing, you are saying, oh Lord, why these things are happening? And you are doing whatever it takes to be able to warn people, to preach, to do the Bible study, to tell people that Jesus is coming. And those who are sighing, they are mourning, they are crying over the abominations that are done on this earth. These are the people who are being, being saved. You may not be perfect. You are just as weak as anyone. But you mourn and you sigh over your own sins. You don't like them. You dislike your sins. You may be weak, but Jesus knows you hate sin. Amen? Amen. You may even fall, but you don't love sin. Amen? Amen. And so Jesus, but that makes a difference. And you're going to be sealed. And after the sealing, there will be a silence of half an hour. So I was talking about, uh, I was talking about my testimony, and I will tell you, I'm, I'm going to talk about sign a little bit, okay? Please allow me to say a short prayer before I go forward, all right? Let's pray. Lord in heaven, this is a very crucial moment. I want to tell you people that you are a God who still show yourself to your people and answer their prayers as they call upon you. 
when we humble ourselves. But I want to thank you for what you did. But that was important. But the most important now is that people will come to know you as a result of what you did in my life. I pray that you will stand by my side, speak to all of us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Okay, so my testimony, these are some of the hills in Rwanda. It's not exactly in this place where I was uh, during the, the genocide. But uh, what takes place in these hills, uh, I managed to uh, cross Kigali, the capital city. Somehow, I told you how I went back and I got a ride, and then I went to a province called Southern Province in an area called Ruhango. Now, Ruhango, you don't need to repeat that. I was celebrating. I understood how, you guys, I understood how when we were at the children of Israel across the Red Sea, you remember the story? And then found themselves on the other side. What did they do? They sang the song. Amen? And, uh, and the Bible tells us when we will cross the sea of this earth, and then see ourselves on the sea of glass, what will happen? We will sing the song of Moses and the song of, of the Lamb. Amen? And so when we cross the, the river called the Yabarongo, it's the river that leads all the way to Nile, uh, River Nile. And we found ourselves on the other side and we heard that there were no killings there. We celebrated. My friends and I sang a song of victory and, 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 and we praised our Lord. But we didn't know that even in this place where we were, actually killings were going to start. And so when we went to Rohan, uh, this particular place, Vicent, who was such a wonderful man, a Hutu, but because some people, I will, I'm emphasizing this not because I want to repeat that name, because some people will tend to think that uh, these were bad, these were good. That's true, some good Hutus killed the people. But in the reality, it was much more than that. It was the devil walking. And if he could use anyone in this country, if he could use white to kill black, he would use them. If he could use black to kill white, if they will allow him, he will use them, right? He will use anyone. That's how it was. And so Vincent was with me, and we celebrated. And he told me, he said, you know what, his home village was around right there. And he said, let's go to my home village, and I will take care of you. I went there. Now, it was Sabbath day. The next morning, we went to church. There was a, meet, a prayer a program. And he said, he asked me, actually, he made arrangements for me to be able to preach. And I went to church. I remember going to church, and I preached there. And I shared my testimony, how a day before the Lord had, some, had rescued me. And people were so excited. Now, let me tell you. It was a church like this. And there were people apparently who loved God. Amen. And they all said, Amen. But guess what? They didn't know that they were going to become killers. So. Wow. In fact, they invited me. They said, Could you wish to ask this coming Sabbath? And I said, I will. And I was supposed to preach, but I did not know that the Sabbath was not going to come where we were going to, we were going to go to church. Because the next Sabbath, the church was closed. Mm. People, church members were in a hiding, and others had turned into killers. And now, the next day, my friend Celestine, who had also gone to his village, my village, my home village was far away. He went and told his parents about me. He was such a good friend as well. And when he arrived there, his father said, see, go back and bring that boy to me. I want to see him, and I will take care of him. So I was well. I was okay, right? And Celestine came, he said he wanted to take care of me, but Celestine came very quickly and he told me to join his family. When I, put, I went there, on Wednesday there was another prayer program, and I went to Celestine's church and I preached without knowing that, that very group of people, they were actually going to be the ones to hunt me down. <laughs> because on the next day, well, the president of the country, the newly elected well, appointed president of the country. He announced very uh, simple program. He announced very publicly. He said, uh, he said when he visited Mutari, he said that now the matter is very well decided. You are either with us or you are against us. 
He said there are people he called in Ibindewa, those who are not concerned. If you seem not to be concerned, even if you are a Kutu, who will kill you as well. In other words, you have to side with the killers or else you get killed. And when he announced that on radio, guess what? Even some Adventists got their weapons and he started killing. Mm -hmm. Of course, a few of them would not. They, I mean, they prayed and they did their best to hide. By the way, let me tell you, there are so many Adventists who could not even hide a little child. But there are Adventists, there's one I know, I'm mentioning the names of my colleagues. He hid about a hundred people. Yeah. Could you imagine? You would of course wonder how did he manage if he was alone. Well, he was moving, putting people into some families, giving them some money sometimes, say, I'm giving you money, you take care of them. And then when they know that so and so is in this family, we go and move him. Now, it was a terrible situation. Now, on the next day when the president announced that, they started hunting me down. And the old man, the father of my friend, was scared. Now imagine you are staying in somebody's family. You have come there for the first time. You know nobody except my friend. And now they are hunting you down. You don't even know the village where you are. You don't know where to go. You just knew there. And they are saying, no, look, they are looking for you. The people you preached to yesterday, they, they are saying they know there is a truth to them. And so he came to me, he said, son, you can stay here because they know you are here. You shared your testimony yesterday morning. And so he said, I will take you to another family in the neighborhood. He took me to another family. And when I reached there, they saw the news had spread all over. He came and moved me to another house. And then from that house to another house, just like an object, you are trying to move. Until finally you got tired. And he took very late in the night. I was tired also. He took me back to his house. I remember sitting with him. And as we were sitting in the living room with the whole family gathered, <coughs> my friend is there. All of us speechless. No one to talk. He looked into my eyes and said, My son, I would be willing to give you food your entire life without you doing anything for me. I would hide you, I would do anything it takes to protect you. But let me tell you, my son, if I dig a hole to hide you, they will dig you out. These people are terrible. If I put you into the ceiling, there are, you know, our houses have ceiling. Like, they do it this way, but you don't go that way. They put a ceiling this way, cross, crossing. And then say, if I put you into the ceiling, they will find you out and kill you. And so he said, my son, I'm not even concerned with the, whether they are going to kill you or not because it looks like all Tutsis are going to die anyway. There's only one problem. Do you know what the problem was? When they come to me, they will force me to kill you. They will tell me to be the one to kill you. And when and they don't even want you to be shot at, they use machetes. And they said, I don't want to see you being cut into pieces. My son, he said, I want you to go. He designed the solution. Now, the solution he designed wasn't the best one. Uh, in Rohan, where I had come from, he said, you know, I heard that there are thousands of Tutsis who have fled to Rohango area. And there are so many to the point that they were not able to kill them with machetes and knives. They will shoot at them because there are many. And he said, you better go there. Maybe you may have a chance to be shot as well. Mm. That was the solution. Mm. It was very late in the night. After we prayed, he told me to follow him. There was another boy who had come to hide there. And I followed him. It was dark. It was very chilly, very cold. Because it was uh, during the month of April. In my country, it's somehow cold. And I followed him. I didn't know the way. It was dark. You can't even have a flashlight. Because if you have a flashlight, killers are everywhere. They have roadblocks everywhere. And so they will suspect that there is somebody who is a tooth who is escaping. You just go, sometimes you fall, sometimes you stumble, and then you just follow. And if the old man went down the valley, we climbed the hill, we went down the valley, we climbed the hill, until we reached one top, 
the, the top of one hill and he said, son, I can't go forward because if I keep going, it will be, they may catch me as uh, they may kill two of us, all of us together. And he said, he said, you know what, you see those guys over there pointing to another hill very far away. He said, do you see the lights over there? I said, yes. That is Rohango town. You go, that's where other two things are. Maybe you will have a chance to be killed by a gun. And uh, now, he was in a bad man. In fact, just imagine you are sending somebody to be killed. And then he reached out his pocket and he gave me 4,000 rand and francs. That was a lot of money those days. How do you send somebody to be killed and then you are giving him money? For what? But that tells you, he simply knew, didn't know anything to do. And he was willing to do whatever he could, but uh, he could not protect me, right? And so he gave, me that, he gave me that money. And then we knelt down right there in the bush and we prayed. We couldn't follow the normal path, because if you follow the normal road, uh, then you may encounter, you may meet the killers, right? You have to go through the bush and uh, like, you know. And then finally, you know, after we prayed, he said, Lord, I know you can, you are able. If you want to protect him, please do it. And if you don't, make it possible that we we'll meet on the sea yes. of glass. Yes. And after we prayed, my friend and I, we held hands, and we, he was a little more, maybe this height, he was younger than me, and we, I had just finished high school, and he was like in, in, in secondary, mm -hmm. the, the, maybe grade 10, and we ran. We decided to run, but running, imagine you are only seeing the lights very far in those hills. And you don't see anything in between because it's dark. And guess what? Sometimes we fell into a trench, and, and then sometimes it was him, sometimes it was both of us. Sometimes we found ourselves in somebody's property. As we were trying to run, we said, oh, this is somebody's house, because you don't know the place where you're going. And then we rushed as not to awaken anyone, or dogs barking him. It was a terrible situation. Until towards the morning, I remember meeting a man, the first killer, who was waking up to go to his duty. He had a machete, and then I realized that if I run, he will actually shout and they will catch me. And I went, God gave me the courage. I approached him, and I went to shake him. And I said, good morning. And uh, guess what? He said, good morning. I said, can you show me the way to Ruhango? Because I didn't know what to say. I mean, you have to ask the question in a way. Say, can you show me the way to Ruhango? And then he looked at me and he said, Do you, are you not a Tutsi? You think you will leave this place? But he was kind of present. <coughs> There's one thing that God wanted to teach me when the old man gave me the 4,000 running back. With no money at all, no one had asked me money except when I was in Kigali. But this time, now that I have money, people are going to ask me for money repeatedly. And good enough, God wanted me to learn a lesson that actually it's not all about money. It's about him protecting my life. Because that money, I thought for a while, when he said, give me money, he said, by the way, why don't you give me money before others come? And I will let you go. And I realized that I have money. So it was a good thing for me. And unfortunately, I had 4,000, uh, 4, but each, 1,000 bill each. Now, I negotiated with him, and uh, the, 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 the bid was that I give him 150, and then I asked him, say, will you give me change? <laughs> and he said, yeah, I'll give you change. Yeah. But once he got the money, he never gave me change. <laughs> And so he escorted me, he showed me, he said, go, and he refused to give me change. Then I met another group of killers, that was now the morning hours. And then I, God gave me the courage. Let me tell you one thing, when you trust in him, you may even die, but you won't just die like a believer, amen? Because yeah. one thing God does, he gives you the courage and the serenity. I went, I approached the killers, and I went to shake him with their machetes. I went to the first one and said, good morning, good morning, good morning. And they were looking at me, good morning, good morning. And I'm wondering what, what is going on. And then I asked them a quick question. I said, are you on duty watching? They said, yes. And I told them, good job. <laughs> and, and when I said, good job, they were just looking at me and I moved. And they were, no one asked me a question. 
And then I moved on. Now, I was close to Rohango that hill they showed me. Now, there was an old woman sitting beside the road. And when she saw me, she sensed something wrong. And she said, sons, come back, come over here. And we, are, we went to her. And she said, you must be Tutis. Where are you going? I said, we are going to Rohango. She said, no, don't go. The Tutis who were there have been killed already. In other words, we had no chance to go and be killed by God because others had been killed already. And so she said, no, don't go. And then all of a sudden, there was a group of killers coming down, shouting. They had a slogan, a word. They were echoing, say, power, power, power. They all echoed the same. Now, when you say the power, it is either because you were attacking a Tutsi whom you saw, or maybe you were hunting for a Tutsi, and every militiaman echoed uh, the same word, power, power. And, and when you were hiding, sometimes they say the power and you just came out of the bush. Because you thought they are just close. And so when he heard the power, she said, she said, no, please go behind that house. That was her house. And we went behind the house. She was a Hutu lady. And we were hiding there until they passed. And then finally she came as if she was picking something. And she said, follow me. And you went into her house. Wow, guess who she was? She saw me with the Bible. And she said, Are you a Christian? I said, Yes, I am. I am an Adventist. She said, Are you a Seventh day Adventist? I said, Yes, I am a Seventh day Adventist too. Amen. 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 And, and she was a Seventh day Adventist. And she said, But she said, You know, I cannot hide you because they are searching this house every minute because they suspect that we must be hiding our brothers and sisters. And so she said, we can't. I knew you would be just to expose you to death. And uh, she gave me some food. Amen? Amen. But the food I couldn't eat, but I still remember the food. Amen? Amen. Why do I remember? Because that was a food of kindness. <laughs> and the, it was a terrible food. Has anyone here eaten cassava? Yeah. yeah. Anyway, maybe the cassava you eat is a little different. But if we have some cassava, we, we, we dry it in, in Rana especially the northern part of Rwanda. They dry that cassava, it dries up. And once it dried, then they will boil it on the top of beans. And then it becomes a little soft, but you don't want to eat it alone. Because you cannot easily swallow it, especially if you are scared as I, as I was. And so she, she gave me the cassava, that's the only thing she could. And we tried to chew food and pass it on those plats, saliva. And then she prayed, and she told me, she said, don't go up, go back where you come from. Where? Back again. We went back. To make a long story short, my friend and I, we decided to go back. And when the evening, we hid ourselves in a coffee plantation. When the evening came, we decided to go back, trace our way to the same family just to report. It was a dangerous thing, right? They didn't even want to see us back. Mm -hmm. But we had nowhere else to go, so we said, we'll go back where we've come from. And uh, now, unfortunately, it wasn't easy, because when we tried to go before, it was dark, fearing that we were not going to know the direction. Uh, Akila saw us. He was coming from probably killing other people. And he came running. And uh, he was going to kill us. And then he said, by the way, don't you have money? Don't you have money? Uh, because there was another group of killers coming as well, and he feared that uh, before they come, uh, if he kills us before they come, they may come and then he will not be able to take what we have in our pocket. And so he started to say, do you have anything? Don't you have money? And we bargained actually. I said, yeah, I have money, but uh, I'll give you the money under the condition that you show me the way to get back where I come from. And he said, yeah, give me money, I'll show you the way. Interesting. And I bargained with him again because I knew I had only a thousand bill, right? And he said, How much? He said, Give me 300. And then I asked, Oh, that was a little money. I said, Will you give me change? He said, I will. Yes. I'm sure you can tell. <laughs> he never gave change. He never gave change. So he took my money. But he was kind enough when the other killers were coming around and said, Follow me, they are coming. Uh, and, and we ran. I don't know if he was kind or if he feared that 
if they come, maybe they will ask us if we have given him money. And, and so he didn't want that to happen. And so we followed him, and uh, he was trying to show us the way. Anyway, when I reached a few miles ahead of us, he held another group of killers and he said, he, as he told us to stay behind, and we were sitting, and then there was a group of killers again that came, discovered us, and they were going to kill us, and then he came and he bargained with them. In fact, they asked him money. He said, these are my people, don't kill them. And they said, will you give us money? And he gave them a hundred, if I remember well. <laughs> and uh, I told him, he said, no, they are asking for just a little money. Why don't you give, him, give them a little more money so that they don't kill us? You have my money. Because he had my change, right? <laughs> and uh, then he said, no, I don't give anything. And there was a tree with his machete as if to tell them that to do whatever you want, then he cut one branch and he said, you deal with them, and he ran away. Uh -huh. Now, since I still had money, I told them, I said, I have money, don't worry. And uh, we bargained. Again, I asked them to give me change, they said yes. <laughs> but never changed, never gave me change. Then they took me to their home, and then the next morning they handed me over again. Imagine the situation. No one is killing me, but they are taking money. It's like God is telling me that, look, you may think that it's money, but money will never help. There is a gentleman. There, is, there are things that money will never be able to do. But God is never limited. Amen? Amen. And so the, next, the last group that caught me when I had no more money, they took me to a slaughtering place, a place where they were killing others. Uh, and... Uh, uh, realizing that I had no money and they were looking for money, I had my jacket on and I had my shoes and I told him, I said, listen, why do you kill me? Why do you take me to this place? What if I, you are looking for 300 francs? What if I give you my jacket and I give you my shoes and you let me go? After thinking for a while, they were very desperate guys, poor guys, I'm sure you know that. And then when I give, I he said, give them to me. And I gave them the shoes him the shoes and, and then the jacket and then I ran and uh, but it was a difficult the good the bad thing is I also because of excitement I also removed the songs oh. and gave everything oh. and and now when the, the road I was going to trade uh, it was terrible oh. stony mm -hmm. and I wasn't used to walking without shoes mm -hmm. and so anyway you know it was, I was bleeding and then following the road, the path, the normal path was very painful because you can't run. Right. And I also feared that ahead of me I may find meet another group of killers. So I went down. But again, in the bush also you have some pieces of wood and and then thorns. It was a terrible situation. Hmm. And I was tired. Boys with me. I went down the valley and I climbed the mountain. Anyway, it's a long story. As I said, you can read, but uh, I went and hid because before it was morning, I went to a bush, a, a, a cassava plantation, and I was hiding myself there so that I can, when the evening comes, I can continue going to my friend's house. Now, in this cassava plantation, they were hunting throughout the day, and I could hear them echoing the same word power power from the valley they could sometimes hold just come holding one hand together so that they make sure no one is going to escape power power and i knew and i was praying i said lord stop them do something it was heavily raining now one thing that helped me it when it rained serious they actually well they 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 they, they disappeared and went because when it rained they went home and then when Again, the rain finished, they came back. And uh, I remember taking my shirt when it was raining, my, now my white, white shirt on. And I said, maybe the best way is to make it as dark as possible. Because I wanted, when I walk night time, remember I've given away my jacket. When I walk night time, they won't be able to know, to see me from afar, right? And I tried to soak it into mud, but it never became dark. It was still white in the night. And to the point that I could see, wow, it's still bright. And anyway, that night I managed to see my, my friend to go back to his home. When they saw me, they were so sad. 
no one could talk. One, they feared that maybe some militiamen saw you coming here, mm. and they can come after you and kill all of us. Mm. Or if not, force me to kill. Mm. And uh, they feared that such a terrible thing could happen to them. And then finally, the old man was so tired and he said, son, there's nothing I can do. Actually, the woman, she looked at me and she cried. Mm. And I looked into her and said, huh? why are you crying? She said, my son, they are going to kill you. I said, no, they are not going to kill you. To kill me. She said, they will kill you. I said, no, they won't kill me. She said, you, are, you don't understand. That childish, they have killed even people who were praying. And I told her, I said, man, I don't worship the God of so and so. Mm -hmm. I worship my own God. He will protect me if he wants me to live. Yes. Let me tell you, friends. Not because a miracle did not happen to so and so, it won't happen to you. Amen. We have a God who is a personal God. Amen. Amen. It is your God. It is not because the whole group have experienced this that you will necessarily experience. God deals with you as individual, amen? amen. This is what we did. He did amen. with Elijah. Yes. There's no one else who has ever brought fire from heaven. Yes. But Elijah prayed and it happened. Yes. Amen. Yes. amen. This is what he did with Daniel. Yes. There's no one else who will ever face the lion that they just let him go. Yes. But it happened with Daniel. Oh. You don't need to always see yourself in the eyes, in the light of others. You are individual. And you have an individual God, a yeah, personal yeah, God. He yeah. cares with you, just even as if you were the only one on this planet. Yeah, yeah. And he knows how to deal with your issues, your problems. Yeah, yeah. And so I told her, I said, Mom, I don't worship the God of so and so. I worship my own God. And the God who protected me all the way from Kigali, he will protect me even here. Now, yeah. imagine I'm saying that and I'm in her house, right? Yeah, and, and, uh, and, I'm, you know, and then she felt like, you Crazy. <laughs> now let me tell you, what she was saying, there was a man, uh, actually, a story had come to her family of a man called Innocent. Innocent was such a wonderful Christian, a, a primary school educator. Now in Rwanda, you couldn't just go to high school. Within a, a class of 40 young people, only one sometimes went to high school, or three or four. And, and uh, Innocent was such a, a teacher, a good teacher, that uh, every parent who had a good child and wanted him to go to high school, he would bring him to Innocent. And he was a wonderful man. When they went to kill him, they said, no, 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 we can kill others, but not Innocent. He's such a wonderful teacher. We cannot kill him. Amen. And one militiaman said, no, we've got to kill them. Snakes are snakes. Mm. And then they killed Innocent. Mm. And then one killer said, no, listen. We've killed so many people, but the one who killed the innocent, he can never be forgiven and go to heaven. Mm -hmm. <sighs> and when he said that, guess what happened? That guy overheard it. And when they reached, they, they went to a place where they were going to get organized. And he put his hand up to ask a question from the commander. And he said, you know what? We have accomplices, people who are betraying us. What do you think of someone who said that uh, the one who killed the innocent cannot go to heaven? And then he said, is he here? And he said, yes, he is. So and so said that. And he said, you kill him immediately. They killed that militiaman. Oh. Because he said that. And after killing him, he had a twin brother. And his twin brother, when he saw his brother who's being killed because of what he said, he was shaking. And he was trembling. And then finally, you know, everybody else just, you know, withdrew from him. And they pulled up and as if to let him suffer at all. And then someone said, look, see what is happening. This guy is not happy with what we are doing. Now how do you become happy when they are killing your brother? And uh, they said, you kill him as well, and they killed him. So this woman was referring to something terrible to the point that she said, no, they will not have pity on you, no mercy. They are merciless. But I knew where a human being can not help. God doesn't wait for people to be good, for you to be protected, amen? amen? They can still be bad, but as long as he lives and you trust in him, he can protect you if he wants, amen? amen. Just pray. Yes. So the old man, he said, he said, now he was desperate, he said, my son, now there's only one bush I know in this area, and I will take you to that bush. 
If your God protects you, He will protect you there. Now something was wrong with that statement. Yes. Why when he said that. that. There is only one bush I know. Mm. I mean, you know, the the bushes that are there, right? No bush. See, if there is only one bush you know and you are taking me there, <laughs> that means the militia may know that bush as well, right? And so they are searching it, and he took me to that bush, but I, there was no argument because I, otherwise I would go just outside. So better to go to the bush and then be found in the bush. But I knew there was no safety except in the hands of God. Amen. And so they took me to that bush before we entered the bush. Now, guess what? I was cold, seriously cold, with the shirt on. It was a rainy season. And I told them, I said, Can you give me a jacket? They said, No, we can't give you a jacket. I said, Why? They said, Listen, this is a rural area. We only have two or one jacket. If we give you our jacket, they will find you and they will know the jacket belongs to us. Oh. And they will come and kill us. So we don't want to endanger ourselves. And I understood it. Mm. So I just had to go with my shirt. But the old man decided to give me a sack cloth. Mm. A sack in which they pack coffee yeah. beans. Yeah. So they, they took a sack cloth. And that, that was not a good thing because it was raining. Imagine if it is raining mm. and you have this sack cloth on you. It is just dripping, it absorbs water, and even when there's no rain, it's still on you, right? And but anyway, I went to the bush, and before I entered the bush, we knelt down and we prayed. And I said, Lord, surround your angels yes, sir. with this bush. Amen. So that I will be protected here. Mm -hmm. And my friend, the boy, went in just like a few feet there, and I was there. And I had my Bible and I had the sack cloth on me. And I was praying. It was like 3 a.m. in the morning. I prayed the whole night. When the morning came, I didn't even know it was morning. I prayed, I prayed, until to my surprise, I heard the bells ringing. Dogs were hunting. Mm. Hunting dogs. And they were hunting. I knew something wasn't right. Mm. And I knew I was in trouble. And I prayed, I said, Lord, whatever it is, Please stop it in the name of Jesus. And as I prayed, I heard people behind the dogs shouting, hunting for their victims. And uh, I saw, I removed the sack cloth because I felt the dog, the bells were crossed. And removing the sack cloth, I saw the dog coming. And, and the dog saw me and it started barking. Mm. And when the dog started, I chased it, but as not to, I didn't make any noise because you, otherwise you will attract the attention of the killer. Mm. I tried to chase it as if to negotiate with it, but the dog could not be negotiated. It kept barking and barking. And then, until finally they said, We found one, come out of the bush, come out of the bush. With my Bible in hand, I went out of the bush. And the little boy followed me. God gave me the courage again. Amen. I decided to greet everyone. I went to the first shake hand and said, Good morning. And it was around, around eight, eight, five, 11 a.m. And I went to the first say, Good morning. And this, he was very scared. He didn't want to shake my hand. The second one, he was scared. The third one shook my hand, but immediately pulled off. He removed his hand. And then he said, see, you know what? His hands are so soft. You know, this is the rural area where they're using their hands for farming. And, mm -hmm. and he said, his hands are so soft, he looks like he's not of this village. Mm -hmm. And then he said, you look strong. We are so tired. We have killed so many Tutsis. We're not going to dig for you. We have been digging and killing and digging. Now you go and dig your way before we kill you. Remember, begging and asking, they say, because they have the guns, they say, will you shoot at us? Will you do us a favor and shoot at us? Remembering what the old man has told me, right? Yeah. And they say, no, we can't waste our bullet. Why would we waste our bullet since you are not stronger than us? He said, the commander told us to shoot us, only those who are fighting us, and you're not strong enough to fight mm -hmm. We will kill you with the had uh, the clubs. This big piece of wood and with the uh, stick with the nails, uh, oh. the, 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 
you know, and I noted those nails being smashed by the sharp ones. I felt like it was terrible. And then they directed us to a place where we were supposed to dig the grave. They gave me a hole and I started digging. Now, as I dug, I recollected everything the Lord had done for me. Okay. And I realized that God was able to do something. Yes, sir. And I started reminding him of his promises. Amen. Amen. I say, Lord, here I am. I'm digging my grave. And I'm surrounded by killers. They are waiting for me to finish, for them to kill me. I remember I preached about you ever since I was young. In the name of Jesus, if you are still the same God I read in the Bible, show me that you have not changed. If you are still the God of Daniel and Shadrach, show me that I have not lied to anyone I've talked to about you. Show me that you are still the same God. But I was digging and nothing was happening. And I kept praying and I'm digging and they are surrounding me. And then I realized, I said, maybe I gotta suggest some solutions to God. I said, Lord, you can give me wings and I will fly. And they will see me going. But I waited for wings and there were no wings. I kept digging. I said, Lord, the grave is going to finish and you are doing nothing. Do something about the situation. And I kept digging. And uh, I dug and I, I dug I said, Lord, you're doing nothing. If there are no wings, you can give, bring about fire. And everybody's going to be scattered as the fire comes and I will run in the process. But there was no fire. I was remembering the case of Elijah. But there's one thing I didn't remember. That God never repeats, this is, doesn't have to repeat the same story. He never runs out of solutions. For him to use the same strategy all over. He has thousands of ways to save his own people, amen? amen. He doesn't have to repeat the same case of the lion's den, amen? amen? He can protect you, just take you out of the dungeon like he did for Paul, amen? amen. And guess what? I started praying, I said, I waited for fire, there was no fire, and I said, Lord, if there's no fire, bring a whole thundering storm. And it thunders and everybody's going to be scattered and I will run. There was nothing. But I've come to realize we have a wonderful God. Amen? Amen. A God who is there even when you think he's not there. And a God who answers even when you think he hasn't answered. God who is never late even when you think he's late. He's always on time. And I kept praying and praying and said, Lord, do something. The grave is going to finish and I was digging it. They are watching me. Now, in the process, God has done something already very great. Somebody, one of the killers has my Bible, right? And they are sitting around me, I'm digging. And the grave is going down as they watch me digging. But the, one of the guys, instead of just seeing me digging, he is looking into my Bible. And as he goes through the pages, he goes through the pages and opens the pages. And he finds some high. Remember the Bible that my sister gave me, which was the highlighted verb, the Bible, right? Now he has. Uh, this is not the same Bible, but every time I bought a Bible, I highlighted it. I read my. Sometimes I went back and read and highlighted the same verses I had highlighted before, amen? To make sure my new Bible is at the line. And so the guy is going through the colors and, 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 and the highlights and, and then he reads and then he says, wait a minute, down a minute. He says, what are these colors about? And then I looked up and I said, these are my favorite verses I read. And they strengthened me, encouraged me. And I highlight and he said, really? And he keeps opening and as he opens and he goes through the pages and then he finds out that he said, he reads, I don't know what he was reading, but he stops me and he said, no. Are you saying, are you sure you prayed all this? And I said, yes, I prayed them. And he said, really? And then he keeps reading. I don't know to, or I don't know what he read, but he reached a point where he said, he said, you know what? Please, I beg your pardon. Can you give me this book before you die? God is awesome. Amen. Amen. Can you give me this book before you die? Now, I, there was no way to resist him, right? Because I knew I was very expecting wings to fly. And so if you have to fly, how are you going to claim in the Bible anyway? 
Then I said, go ahead and take it. But other killers didn't allow him to finish the sentence. They shouted. They said, no, you can take the Bible. That's our book. It doesn't belong to him anymore. If you need it, you'll pay money. He said, no matter how much money you need, I'll pay it. Wow. And he was willing to pay the Bible. Amen? Amen? And he kept reading. And I'm taking and I'm praying. I'm saying, Lord, you need nothing. I'm wondering. God had done something already. In the process as I did, the gentleman who was now with me, ready to get my Bible at all costs, he told the, he told the guys when he stood up and said, Gentlemen, please I beg your pardon. I know we kill this man, but allow me to help him to dig the grave. Mm. He was kind, although it wasn't good for me. Because he, he jumped into, they said he's even delaying us, go ahead and dig for him. And he jumped into the grave. He started digging very quickly. It's as if he's saying, well, we kill him, he doesn't have to suffer, right? But for me, I wanted to take more time to pray. And he jumps in, and he digs, and he says, Lord, you're doing nothing. This man is so strong. He's finishing the grave. Guess what? God had done something. As soon as the grave is dug, everyone approached, as they approached to strike me. One who seemed to be their commander. Mm -hmm. Right before they strike me, say, Oh no, don't do that. And they say, What? He said, No, don't kill him yet. He said, Why? We're not going to bury him in this grave. He said, Why? Because this is our property. I'm thinking we shouldn't be burying these strangers in our property. Let him go and dig another grave near the highway. Mm. And then they say, what about this grave? See, you remember we killed the brother-in-law of so-and-so. They had killed the brother-in-law of one of the killers who was married to a Tutsi, who went to seek uh, uh, to hide in his house, in his brother's-in-law's house. And then he told him, he said, I can't hide you and hide your sister. I'm trying to hide your sister. You go to the bush. And when he went to the bush, they, they were killing others, smashing them with the machetes and hammers. And then he came back and said, please shoot at me. And so they had shot at him. And uh, he said, no, we will use this grave to bury the brother in law so and so. Let them go and dig another grave near the highway, because that belongs to the government. We shouldn't be using our properties to bury this stranger. And everybody said, yeah, 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 that's a good idea. And I was given more time. Yeah. Now something changed the whole course. Guess what happened? Ironically, one of the killers, as they brought the, the dead body, putting him in the grave, starting to dig to, to bury him, one of them said, hey, guys, obviously they had some connections with the Roman Catholic Church, even though they weren't probably good Catholics, because I don't think Catholics teach to kill. Uh, at least, that's not what they teach publicly. And uh, the guy came and said, listen, why don't we pray for these people we are killing? In another words, say, yeah, yeah, let's pray for them, but ironically. And he said, Mary, mother of Jesus, receive him. In another one, Mary, equally the same thing, Mary, mother of Jesus, receive him. Mary, mother of Jesus, receive him. And everyone was saying they felt bad. I said, Lord, now in the name of Jesus, these people are mocking you. I don't pray for wings anymore. Don't allow me to fly. Don't bring fire anymore until I have told them about who you are. Because it looks like they don't know you. They are mocking you. And I say, Lord, please give me a chance to be able to speak to them before I fly. And guess what? They buried him. And once we reached the highway, I approached the man with my Bible. And I told him, I said, please, can I borrow this book? There was a very good, near the highway, as you know, and it's short grass, level place. And I said, can I borrow that book to say a word before I dig the grave? And he said, he was now with me, he said, yeah, yeah, go ahead. He gave me the book. But there was another killer right next to him. And he said, no, he has nothing to teach us. He's our enemy. Now, he said, no, he's got to talk. Let him talk. We don't know what he's going to say. And I said, he has nothing to tell us. Now, the whole group was divided into two. Some saying, he has nothing to tell us. Others saying, no, let him talk. We don't know what he's going to say anyway. And until one guy said, no, he said, no, after all, we have the right to kill him. Now, no, the same guy who had my Bible. We have the right to kill him, but we have no right to refuse him to talk. And I wondered what kind of right was that. <laughs> and if you're saying, no one, we have, we have the right to kill, 
but not the right to refuse him to talk. And, uh, but he kind of silenced them, but they were about to fight, very angry. And then one of the, the chief, the commander, the one who suggested that I go and dig another grave, he came over and said, now listen, are you going to kill each other because of this stranger? Let me advise one thing. Some said, no, 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 we don't want to hear from him. Others said, no, let him talk. And he said, no, hold on. Let me tell you one thing. You sit down, and I will tell you what to do. And all of everybody said. He said, now, those of you who don't want him to talk, sit down and shut your ears. Hmm. And those of you who want to talk, you sit down and listen. That was fair. Hmm. And then after that, you will kill him. <laughs> everybody sat down. But they didn't close their ears. Amen? Amen. No one, even the ones who didn't want me to talk, were the, one, the, more, the ones more attended, right? Listening to what I was saying, now, I will be honest, I will never be able to preach the same sermon. It, was only, it wasn't me speaking. It was God himself speaking. Amen? Amen. I took my mic and I started thanking them. I said, I want to thank you guys for the opportunity you're giving me to speak. And I want to thank you because you are praying, but you are wrong. You are doing the devil's work. You don't know what the Bible says. And I told him, I said, no, you think you are fighting the foot of war, but this is about Christ and Satan, and you are on the side of the devil. And I said, you are praying for the people you have killed, you don't know what the Bible says. Even you, when you die, Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verse 5 says, the living know they will die, but the dead know nothing. So the only chance you have is to pray for yourselves before you die. And let the people you are killing pray for themselves before you kill them. And I, was, I told them, I made sure I said, no, I'm not begging for mercy. Because I know, even if I die, no one, none of you will be able to stop me from rising. The time is coming when Jesus will come. And I spoke. That was in my power. And I remember telling them, I said, you are killing two things. Telling them, saying that these are your enemies. But among them, there are the children of God. And you have a few among the Hutus as well who trust in God. And the Bible says these are the chosen generation. A royal priesthood, the holy nation, his only special people. People who are no longer Hutus or Tutsis. People who have given themselves to God and have a different identity. And I told them, I said, these you may kill them, but the time is coming when they will rise for eternal life. Amen. And I told them, the only chance you have is now. And as I see that, guess what, some of them were weeping, wiping out their tears. And I saw them, they were, you know, some of them were convincing each other, calling each other and talking to each other as if they were talking about something very serious. And after I finished, I said, now, after like 15 minutes, I see, they say, now listen, would you allow me to go and dig another grave? And I will say the closing prayer after I finish to dig the grave. And they say, they didn't allow me to I expected that prayer to be like the prayer of Elijah after he had built the altar. But they didn't allow me to finish to have that chance. Maybe God was going to bring about fire, amen? But I didn't have that chance, but he did that which he chose, amen? amen. Because as soon as I said that, one of them stepped over and he said, no, ladies and gentlemen, there were so many people, elder people. Now the whole village had come and I was preaching to a large audience, probably much more than you hear. And they were saying now, they were saying, no, he said, ladies and gentlemen, if you kill this man, let his blood be upon you, I'm no longer with you. And everybody was saying, no, 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 they were shouting now. Everybody said, no, we can't kill such a person. It was that. It was just a human being. Yeah. Just another truth, see. Mm -hmm. I was in, God was just covering me with his wings. Amen. 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 God had answered my humble prayer. And they all shouted. And then he said, now do you agree that we let him go so that his blood will, be, will not be upon us? And uh, they said, please let him go, let him go. And then he said, now if you allow him to go, let me warn you. I know some of you are talkative. If you go around saying we release the Tutsi, other Hutus will come and kill us. But before we are killed, we will kill anyone who will say that. They were supposed to keep the secret. And everyone would say, no, we won't tell anyone, we won't tell anyone. Imagine. And then I told them, I said, do you want me to pray for you? They said, go ahead and pray for us. They said, Lord, please forgive them their sins. Please. I know. 
If your mercy is still upon them, please forgive them and help them to realize what they are involved in and accept them as, as your children and, and help them to be able to repent. And as they finish to pray, guess what? One, the, the, the leader came in and said, no, here are two, these two boys. Let them take you to their homes, to their homes, so that no one, those who are not here will not see you. With their clubs, they escorted me. Amen. Mm -hmm. And I was going. It's called with two escorts, two boys with their clubs. And they saw me going, amen. amen. And they took me to their home. And they went, they brought meat, they brought food. But I was vegetarian. <laughs> that was the second time, by the way. I told them I don't eat meat. Because I had told God, I said, I am vegetarian and I'm not going to change any of my principles amen. because of this. Amen. And then one of them said, Why don't you eat meat? I said, I am not meat. He said, you mean I think it's not it me? They say some do, but I don't. He said, don't worry. We are going to go and get some beans. They brought fresh beans, amen? amen. They brought some bananas, amen? Mm -hmm. They went and brought some ripe bananas, and they brought bananas for me, and I ate. Now, they were my servant, and they said, don't worry. They were not repentant. Only God. Just like the raven when they brought bread to Elijah, amen? Yeah. Because they told me, they say, now, stay here. We are going to hunt for other tutsis, but we won't kill you. We will even, we will hide you until the war is finished. And I was in the house and they went to kill others. Mm -hmm. Now, two days went by. I was enjoying the war. Mm -hmm. Very small, hard to not, not very comfortable. But it was much, much more comfortable than the bush life. Mm -hmm. Much more comfortable than the grave. Amen? Amen. And I was praising God, but that was short lived. Mm -hmm. It was only for a while. Because all of a sudden, around 11 a.m., one of the young boys came running. And he was saying, he was like, You come out of my house, come out. And they said, Why? What is wrong with you? He said, No, come out of my house. Now he had totally changed. He said, What do you want? Why do you want me to go out? Daytime, they will see me. Anyone who passes by will see me and kill me. And he said, No, you come out, they are coming. Everybody knows that you are hiding here. And uh, he said, No, the rumor, uh, the news has spread all over. Obviously, they couldn't keep the secret. And when I resisted, he said something which should be a lesson for us. He said, You have a God. I don't have a God to protect me. Mm. <laughs> oh, ladies and gentlemen. Mm. If you give in your life to Jesus, yes, you are not anybody. Amen. You are special, amen? amen? Don't you see yourself like anyone out there? You may look like them, you may be as short as them or as tall as them, but you are special. Just remember the prophet of God when they went to bury somebody who was dead and they left his body there and then the body touched the bones of the prophet like, what happened? The man rose. He, the prophet was dead. He didn't rise. He was still dead. But the man who was being buried, when the body touched the bones of the prophet, he came running. He said, why did you do this to me? They said, what are you still, why are you following us? You are dead. He said, no. You see, you've thrown me to the bones of the man of God. And now I'm uh, 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 risen. Imagine. Oh. Dead or alive, we are not anybody. Amen? Amen. We are the children of the living God. Oh. And he said, you have a God, I have no God. Now realizing that he was determined, I went out, there was a beans plantation in front of the house, and I went into the beans, and I hid myself there. I was in the beans. I could not lie this way. Short beans, and they could see my shoulder, they came and searched the house, I was not there, and then they went, God protected me there. Now evening came, now the bush they had put me in, I had been discovered, so now I had to go back to my friend's house again. It was a terrible situation. Every time they saw me, it was like, I, when they saw me, they said, are you back? Said, yes, I'm back. Because they feared that someone saw me and they were in trouble. And then the old man, very quickly, he actually said, you know, I'm tired. Now you have your friend. My friend, remember, it was my friend who took me to, to his father's house. And he said, now your friend, let him take you wherever he wants. I don't know where to take you, let him take you wherever he wants. And so my friend and his brother, they escorted us just to the nearby bush, a small bush. Now, 
we were just there, let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, I think I will not abuse because you need to rest, amen? But I want to share with you this story in this book. It's a God of heaven. Yes, sir. I've never seen God as I saw him in this bush. You might say, hey, what about the grave? I saw God in the grave. Hmm. But the God I saw in the bush was a different God. Hmm. Not because he was different in nature, but he was so wonderful. Now, the God I saw in the grave was the God I cried to, and he answered my prayer despite myself. But the God of the bush was the God whom I gave value to, and I honored, and I said, even if it means dying, let me die. Amen? Amen. He was an amazing God. When I was in this bush, I entered the bush. It was a thick bush. But guess what? You enter the bush, it's night time. When the morning comes, you realize it's just as plain as this. It's not as thick as you thought it is thick. Because anyone can see you from over there. And you don't have a way to move. Because if you move, this is a place where every 100 feet, sometimes at two, three hundred, you have a house sometimes. So if you go out, they will see you anyway. And I was in this bush. And I was praying. I remember seeing when I was in the bush, I just lied down. And I, I saw the, 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 the shoes abandoned. And I sensed that these shoes might have been abandoned by someone who was killed. And I knew there was no security there. And so I was there praying for a while. I prayed. But the time came when I got discouraged. Ladies and gentlemen, I probably went to some degree similar experience with job. And maybe job taken care of. Because I reached a point. Imagine just lying down there. It's not a good grass, it's just in the bush. There are some people, there are some roads, and I tried to clear them. And I was, it was, I reached a point where the whole body was painful. You don't have any sleeping bag. You don't have, not even, you just there. And then you turn this way, you turn this way, you turn this way, one week, two weeks, I was extremely tired. It's raining every day. Mosquitoes are biting. And you are chasing them, but you can't chase mosquitoes when you are in a bush. You can chase them if you are in a hole, maybe. But in a bush, you chase this one, what about the one from behind? And I tried to fight them. And then it was a terrible situation. Now I could touch my, it was raining, but guess what? Thirsty as I was, it couldn't quench my thirst. I tried to, when I saw you know, the drops of water falling from the leaves, I tried to just take my, my tongue to wait for the drop of water to fall on my tongue, as if just to relieve myself from thirst. But it was not now. Two weeks. Then I developed some cough mm. and some malaria. Mm. And I was coughing. Mm. Now as I coughed, something was very terrible. Because my friend was coming every like midnight or past midnight. He was coming to see me. And my friend had a problem. He was in balance. He had one leg which is not as, as tall as the other. He had had an accident as a young person. Now he would walk this way. So, and he was scared that they would find him coming to see me in the night. Now imagine as I was coughing and, and, and struggling, when I touched my skin, it was like a dry leaf. And guess what? When he came and he found me coughing, bringing me some food, I couldn't even eat the food because I had developed some sore in, in my throat. And then I kept coughing and he said, oh, Jesus, are you coughing? I said, yes. You don't know where we are. We are in the bush. What if you kill us here? You coughing in the bush. You, how can you cough if you are in the bush? <laughs> like talking, I'm not going to cough. But neither my friend nor myself knew that it was impossible. Because I tried to hold myself, not cough, but it was impossible. 
I tried to stop myself from coughing. And then I ended up coughing again over and over. I didn't pray, God, you are going to endanger my own life. And they would kill two of us. Why are you coughing? Stop coughing. I said, I'm not going just to end up coughing. Now it's like, it's going to happen, right? And I coughed as if it were not now. Now, the next day, I remember I was desperate and I was tired and I told God, I said, Lord, enough is now. Now I'm going to go out of the bush. If it is death, let me die. If it is life, save my life. Show me. If you are my God and you've protected my life, now a time has come when you have to show yourself as a God. I decided to end my bush life because I was discouraged. And I got ready. I was ready to share with my friends the next day. When he came, when he came that evening, guess what? I told him, I said, Celeste, I don't want to stay in this bush anymore. And he said, what? I'm not going to stay here. Now, now I can bear the situation. Life in this bush is worse than death. I better die or God is going to walk out of here. Guess what? Celeste, maybe you actually need to encourage someone. Amen? Maybe someone needs encouragement. Maybe just one word. Maybe just one prayer may save somebody from dying. Amen? Because my friend encouraged me. When I was determined to go and approach face the killer, I reasoned that maybe I was going to preach another sermon, but who knows? He said, you know what? Jesus, that is presumption. It's not faith. It is like you are committing suicide if you are taking yourself to the killers. Don't do that. Let's keep praying. And he encouraged me. It was difficult, but he encouraged me. And I kept reading. And then the next day when he came, unfortunately, he was more desperate than me. He was so much disheartened and discouraged. And I looked, I, 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 I actually, well, I couldn't see him well, but he was agonizing. He was sighing and he said, Celestine, what is wrong with you? He couldn't talk to me. Why are you not talking? By the way, this was the first, the second time. This is the same guy again, they couldn't talk when I was in Kigali. And he says, Listen, why are you not talking? I sensed something was wrong and he didn't want to reveal that to me. And I said, why are you not talking to me? He said, fine, he said, for Jesus, there's no reason to hide you. See what? This bush is not yours. I said, what are you saying? I know the bush is not mine anyway. This is not my bush. He said, no, the bush is not yours. I said, what do you mean the bush is not mine? I know it's not mine. He said, you know? My mom, according to him, the killers in that village had had a meeting and they decided that they would not continue hunting Tutsis because they thought they had killed every single Tutsi they knew. And so they said, if there's any Tutsi hiding, he must be from somewhere else and he must be hidden by being hidden by someone right here. And so all of us must be responsible as to search in your own property, your own garden. If we find a tutti hiding in your land, we will know that you are the one feeding him, hiding him, and he will kill you. And so they said, be responsible now. Make sure no tutti is in your garden, in your field. And so the mother, his mother, he knew I was there. And he told his son, she told his son, her son, and she said, listen, son, they are going to come and kill the whole family. They were like seven children. So they will kill all of us because of that stranger. What if you tell him to go elsewhere? And the son said, no, mom, where am I going to take him? And she said, I've been arguing with my mom throughout the week, telling her that you have to be here. But my mom has no faith. She feels they will discover you because she's worried about her family. She's saying, and I understand, she's saying, that they will kill the whole family, which was not supposed to die in the first place. And you, you are going to die. Because she's reasoning that after all, how long are you going to be in this bush? They will discover it, and they will kill the whole family. And so I've been arguing with my mom, and finally the mother, she called the whole family to convince the boy. And they, he was the second boy. And then they convinced him and said, no, listen, you are endangering the family entirely the entire family because of that stranger. And he's gonna be killed, they have killed everyone. How can he survive forever? Because they didn't see the end anyway. They didn't know it was going to come to an end. Mm -hmm. And then they said, well, 
you better take him somewhere else. We are giving you one week. Find another location where you take him. And he said, they have given me one week. And I told him, I said, Celestine, are you going to abandon me also? The word he told proved to me what a prepared Christian will be able to do or say during the time of trouble. It's not a word you will hear from a kind of somebody who is just in his flesh. Okay. He told me, he said, listen, I will not abandon him. Amen. Even if he begins to die, I'm ready to die with you. Amen. And I got courage. And I told him, I said, is that what you're saying? If that's the case, let's bring this week to God. They have given you one week. Let's bring this in the hands of God and God find a solution within one week. And I told him, I said, Celestia, I don't need to fast because I don't have food in the bush anyway. You go and fast. Don't eat anything, and I will pray, and we pray for the whole week, and let us bring the matter to God. And God is going to bring about a solution. Amen? Amen. They have asked you to find a solution within one week. And I believe God has a solution. We prayed, ladies and gentlemen, I told you I found God in this bush. I decided to pray. While I had been complaining about my health, about my skin, about my, my cough, and all kinds of I reached a point, I decided to read the Bible from, now I read from morning ever, as, as soon as I could see the light. Mm -hmm. I was reading, just to pause when I was praying, and then to read again. Imagine the whole week, I'm telling you, there was no one single minute, I wasn't either praying or reading the Bible. And I found what it means to read the Bible. And I found what it means to pray. And I was reading. And every time I read, and then I told the boy, I said, you be praying. And when I finished reading and praying, while I will be praying, you will be reading. And so non-stop, for seven weeks, seven days, we read and prayed, we read and prayed. And I told God, I said, Lord, I know you are in charge. You created the heavens and the earth. Show me that you are the God I have served. There is one thing you can do. If you want, you take me out of this bush. But I prayed for one thing. I said, don't allow me to go. Before I tell this lady, the mother of my friend, that you are the God who answers prayers. Don't allow me to separate from her until I have shown her that you are a God. Guess what? God did it. Ladies and gentlemen, I prayed, and then I reached a point, interestingly, in the process, I reached a point where I didn't feel pain anymore. Amen. No more suffering, amen? amen? I felt like I was relieved. I only had one problem as I read. I started recalling some of the sins I had committed in the past. And I wondered if God had forgiven me. Like the time of trouble of Jacob, amen? Yeah. And I wondered if God had accepted me. That was the only worry. I reached a point where I remember very minor details of words I spoke in the past, maybe which were unpleasant to someone. And I repented, a time came. Anyway, to make the long story short, my friend was praying, and I was praying, and I was reading, and I was praying, and I was reading, until, now, we started on Saturday evening. Our goal was that Saturday we were going to be delivered from the bush. Miraculously, God was going to bring about a solution. And I told God, I said, Lord, maybe I have the faith I need. If I don't have that faith, give me that faith. Amen. And I prayed. Now, on Friday, because I couldn't count days, I thought it was Sabbath. Mm. Now, on Thursday evening, I prayed for the Sabbath blessings. And I said, this is the day you finished to create everything. Now, you've created me enough. Enough, enough. Now, I'm going to go out of the bush tomorrow, but it was going to be Friday. Because I couldn't count days in the bush. And so, the whole day of Friday, I was praying for Sabbath blessings, just ready to take off. And guess what? When the evening came, Celestine came very late in the night. And I was looking up and wondering, has anything happened? How do I know that God has answered? I said, Celestine is coming. And I will ask him what might be happening out there. And when he came, I said, Celestine, we must go. He said, why? Because God must have answered our prayer. He said, why are you discouraged? 
I said, no, I'm not discouraged, but this is the seventh. We are now on Sabbath. I said, no, today is Friday. He said, really? I got another Sabbath, amen? I said, well, at least upon time. I rested two Sabbaths in a row, amen? I mean, in one week, two Sabbaths. And I took again another Sabbath day to pray. And I prayed and said, Lord, this is the Sabbath. I really Sabbath day now. Do walk out a miracle. And I prayed, guess what? When the evening came, let my friend Celeste would give me another argument. I said, I'm not going to wait for him this time. Because I believe God has answered my prayer. I told God and said, Lord, I know you have answered my prayer. I don't need to see the sun stopping. I don't need to see the moon stopping. I just need to trust you have answered. If you haven't answered, it is your problem, it's not my problem. And I told the boy, I said, listen, we got to go out of the bush. And we held hands and I said, just follow me. We went to the nearest hall. Finish our life bush, our bush line. And we went to the nearest hall. And guess what, as we entered, we, we didn't enter the house immediately. We just stood at the, the, the veranda, down out there, before we, near the window, and the door was like here, who was standing there, praying before we could knock and go inside, because we said, it is finished. And guess what, as we prayed, Lord, this is the last prayer. We are going to finish, we will not go to the bush anymore. We have prayed for faith, we say, even if we don't have faith, you give us the faith we need. And as I was praying immediately, as soon as I say the man, ready to knock and enter, I saw somebody coming with an umbrella. It was raining. And he came, I was standing like here at the window. He comes and knocks to the door. And as he knocks, somebody switches on the light inside the house. And then I saw his face. And I recognized him. He was the brother of my, uh, the father of my friend. And so I went to him, the old man, and I said, Father. And he looked at me and said, Son, are you for Jesus? He said, Yes, your God has answered your prayer. Mm -hmm. No, you might think there is something else I'm leaving behind. There is no other status. The very first thing he says right as I finish to say my prayer, ready to knock, I see somebody coming with an umbrella and he knocks and then they light, I'm scared, and then I see his face and I went to him and they say, Father, and he said, For Jesus. See, your God has answered your prayer. Amen. Amen. And I said, How? He said, You know what? Right now. I'm coming to warn the people in this family. Because no one in this village is in the house. There is another army that is approaching. And we heard the army is coming. So everyone in this village has run away. And this man probably he doesn't know. I'm coming to warn him to run. And let me tell you, your friend said he's not going to run with the killers. He is at all. You go and join with him and keep praying to your God. Amen? Amen. He said you will not run. Jesus, I will, I will go to his home and I will not even go through the bush. I will just take the normal road. And as a sign that you have answered my prayer, I pray that in the name of Jesus you will clear my way. Everybody, people might be running. Clear my way, Lord. Let them get out of my way because this is my way. I'm going to the house. And I went to the house and I found my friend in prayer and we knelt down to praise the Lord. Ladies and gentlemen, there is a God in heaven. Amen. For those of you who may not read the book, let me just share a little bit. That was the end. But it was not the end of a time of trial. Because I had survived to pray for God to rescue me, but I was surviving as a Tutsi. And after the genocide, the victims were in trouble now. I mean, the killers were in trouble. They had to run out of the country or be taken to prison. And being taken to prison, it was a survivor like me who would actually go and say, you killed my family. And I would call the police and say, no, he has killed my family. And take, I had to choose the way to revenge or to forgiveness. Mm -hmm. It wasn't easy. 
Mm. I remember when I heard the news, because so far I have survived, but I didn't know anything about my family. And when I met the first person from my home village, he told me what had happened. Everyone had been killed. Mm. And I was asking, what about so? And she said, no, everyone, don't ask any questions. Everyone had been killed. And I felt, for a while, I felt like I had no meaning at all. Mm. I was like, what is life? What should I live for now? We're talking about Africa. Where, when you live, it is for the sake of the family. Mm -hmm. Family ties are so strong. When you go to school, it's for the family, amen? Mm -hmm. You don't just go to school for yourself. You're going to live in California, they will stay in Texas, and then they will depend on themselves, on their own, and they will, no. You go there, you will sponsor your siblings, your cousins, your, and so I was like, what is the meaning of life then? Because my, my whole family has been killed. I felt for a while as if life was coming to an end. But then that's where the provision, that which you have eaten, will sustain you. Amen? And I felt, I heard the voice of God saying, My son, how did you survive? How are you right here? And I remembered all the roadblocks I crossed. And I remembered the grave I died. And I remembered my entire life in the bush. And I say, Lord, I belong to you. If I survive, it is not for me, it is for you. Teach me, tell me what I'm supposed to do. Because it's not for me, I understand it's for you. It's not for me to enjoy the family life. It's not for me to enjoy the siblings and presence. It's for me to give you glory until Jesus comes. Amen. And God encouraged me. I went back to church, I started preaching. Now a time had come when I had to go to my home village now to preach. And why? Preach to who? To the killers hmm. of my father. And why did I have to? Something before the genocide. I had prayed for a job. And I told God that if he gave me a job, I would take my entire salary, go buy literature, LNGY literature, the Bibles, and then conduct an evangelistic campaign in my home village without knowing that my family was going to be killed. And now, after the genocide, I got a job, and I, I was teacher, a teacher at Tatapate, and I was supposed to go to my village to preach because that was the vow I had made to God. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, For Jesus, you better go. You promised that once you get your first salary, you will go to your village and preach. Now, which village? I said, No, no. This is not the village I was talking about. In the village of killers, everybody was, you know, if you were not a killer, maybe your father, maybe your, your uncle, maybe your cousin. And, and, and they killed my family. How can I know that they will kill me? But the voice said, that which you have promised, you have to go and fulfill. And I prayed, and I suffered, and I prayed, and I suffered, until I struck, I was, I was struggling. Then one day, I remember parking, and I said, in the name of Jesus, I'm going. I used my salary, I bought literature, and I told the pastor, I'm coming. The pastor couldn't believe, he said, how? Are you going to come there? It was the Tirquaza zone. That was a place where killers were literally still there. Because, but I decided to go. And I went. The genocide had been start, stopped, but killers were still there. there. were There was no survivor to tell the story. There was no one to take them to court. And I was the one coming. And when they heard I'm coming, I remember entering the church I used to go to. And just the church which used to be full, you know, in oftentimes we know where we sit when we go to church. Yeah. And you know where your family used to sit. And I remember entering that church and seeing maybe Elizabeth would be sitting there. Any of my, my brother would be sitting there. My aunt, my ladies and gentlemen, it was a terrible time when I was in that church and no one wants to look into my eyes because they are either the relatives of the people who killed or they, were, they even killed some of them. And they couldn't even face me into the eyes. The pastor himself was wondering if I was ever going to preach and have people attend my meeting. But in the afternoon, I remember preaching my first sermons. The attendants were mostly men of women and children, no men. They didn't come. They were mocking and wondering if I was really coming to pray, to preach or to revenge. And as I stood to preach my first sermon and finish, 
Guess what? The whole village, the next day, men were coming one after another. And we couldn't fit in any church building. We were just outside. The whole mountain was here, filled full of people. And I preached only one week. About 120 were baptized within one week. Amen. Amen. Everyone was just coming to see a survivor preaching. Hmm. It wasn't only one year later. Not even one year, actually. It was like the month of May, the following May. It is in church. I will stop. One, one more time. I want you to think about this. We've heard, we've heard of a God who answers prayers. Mm -hmm. A God who says, call me and I will show you wonders. Amen? A God who says that uh, a mother may actually abandon you, but I will never abandon you. And for a while, sometimes we have even believed that uh, this may be true or not true. But I want to assure you that this is a God of wants us prayer. You know, oftentimes I've come to realize that when there are no miracles being worked out, it is not because God is not in the business of answering prayers. It is only because we are not praying anymore. And when we kneel to pray, God wants to answer our prayers. We are nowhere to be seen. We are gone. Just kneel down one day, one hour, not even one hour, sometimes 10 minutes. Not even 10 minutes. And then you just pray, say, oh, I know he's not going to answer me. And then G.Y. says that uh, we don't have answers to our prayers because we release the hand. We let go of the hand of God too early. Jesus talks to his disciples when they tried to cast out the demon and fail, and they told him, what is the secret? And he says, that kind of demon cannot be cast out only, it can only be cast out only through fasting and prayer. Amen. Most of us, Amen. we are living in a time, postmodern time, when we don't think that fasting is even important as it used to be in the past. But if it happened with Jesus, for two days, how much more you and I need to pray. It is in gentle. We want to be another Paul when we actually don't act like Paul. Paul used to shake the snake, just shakes it the back, just into the fire, and he didn't even have any effect at all. But who, what was Paul doing and where was he going? And you want that to happen today when you are not even involved in any Bible study throughout your entire life. How many Bible studies have you ever conducted? When you are not with God, you're not connected with Him, and you want Him to answer our prayers. You know there are some type of pets. When they are looking forward to receiving something from you, they will actually come and get close at you. But as soon as you give them something to take, the pet, the dog, you want to see, you will just run and eat it somewhere else. And this is sometimes what I do with what you do. Ladies and gentlemen, there is a God in heaven, a God who answers prayers. I just want to conclude this testimony telling you that there is a God in heaven. I don't, I'm not telling you this to, 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 to weep, to cry with me. I lost my entire family. And uh, he probably lost your entire family, I'm not sure. But uh, there are so many others in the world, not many by the way, because very few. But allow me to tell you this, ladies and gentlemen. We have hope, amen? amen. Because probably most of the people who died this time, they died more ready that they would have ever been ready in their entire life. Because in a time such as this, most of them were on the top of mountains, some of them were in church buildings, they were praying. And so the problem wasn't theirs, the problem was the, the problem of the people who were killing them. Just like the ones who stormed to death, Stephen. And so the Bible says you will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, no mourning or crying or pain. Oh, for the old order of things has passed away. The time is coming. I'm looking forward to that time when Jesus will appear on the cloud of heaven and you and I are going to meet him in the air. And I'm looking forward to that day and I know it is very soon, soon and very soon indeed. Oh, how I wish you and I today would actually reach out the hand of Jesus while he's still begging and saying, give me your heart and trust in me. Just love me. Just come to me. There's nothing I'm looking for. I'm asking you for no other sacrifice. Just give me your heart. Just give yourself to me. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, have you trusted in the Lord as you should have done in the past? Have you given your entire life to him as you should have done in the past? Are you really still praying 
Are you still trusting? Are you warning the world that's perishing? My prayer this evening is that right now we give our lives to Jesus, we commit ourselves to Him, and He is ready to welcome us. If you are willing to kneel down with me, if you are willing to bow down, if you can kneel, you can just bow down. But I want to say a prayer. I want to say a prayer for someone. Is it God in heaven? I want to say a prayer of commitment. I want to say a prayer of dedication. And before I say that prayer, I want each one of us to say his own or her own prayer. Just say a word or two to God within 10 to 20 seconds. Just say something that is on your heart. It may be a wish, something you feel like is disturbing you and you want God to do something in your life. I want you to say that prayer. Maybe a sin that you are repenting from. I want you to pray. Maybe it is one of the commandments of God you are still violating. I want you to pray and ask God to forgive you. And it's the God in heaven, ladies and gentlemen. Let's help ourselves and pray. And then I will continue and close with a prayer. You are God and there is none other like you. You are the creator of the universe. And yet, you are a God who allows yourself to the level of each and every one of us to just fellowship with Him and to take care of Him and to love Him and to assure Him of your presence. I want to praise you, Father, for the moment you've allowed me to stand in front of your people those who are watching from online and those who are right here in this building, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you will accept us as your children. Forgive us from our sins, Father. Forgive each and every one of us. In one way or another, we might have wronged you. I pray that our sins will be wiped out. Lord, I pray for this person, this very individual. You know him or her better than I do. You know the needs of his heart or her heart. I know you know the details of his heart. I pray in the name of Jesus. Maybe this individual has not fully committed himself or herself to you. Now that we kneel down in the name of Jesus, I pray that your mighty hand will touch him or her, and in the name of Jesus, that his sins or her sins will be forgiven. Father, accept us as we are and help us to live a victorious life from now on. Live according to your will and trust in you because you are a God who is in charge, a God who never disappoints his own. Lord, I pray also for those of us who are sick. Some of us might be suffering from a disease, a terminal disease, or any kind of ailment that is disturbing. In the name of Jesus, I pray that all this fear will go away. That in the name of Jesus, they will give just their hands into your hands and count on you and trust on you and just wait upon you, Father. Lord, I pray. I pray for the younger ones among us. Help us, Lord, to obey you and to follow you and to trust in you. There is a joy in following you. There is a power in loving you. It is not something to be ashamed of. Lord, I pray, because I know you are coming soon. Every one of us who is kneeling before you, who humbles himself in your presence, in the name of Jesus, I pray for a reunion one day soon that we will be able to meet before your throne. Lord, I pray that when sin shall be no more, when death shall be no more, when you will wipe away our tears, we will be able to hug each other as we bow down before your presence to live forever, to part no more, forever and ever celebrating your victory. May you bless us and dismiss us with your love. And before we dismiss, I pray special blessings for the pastor. I pray special blessings for the elders, the deacons and deaconesses, their spouses. I pray for every member. I pray for anyone who doesn't know how to make a decision for the way to go in this life, whether it's your will or not. I pray in the name of Jesus 
that you will walk ahead and they will just be able to follow you step by step. Let the doors where you cannot put your blessings be closed in the name of Jesus. And where you put your blessings, show them the way so that they can walk through. May you bless us, Father. Dismiss us with your love until we meet again. In Jesus' name, amen. I pray. Let everyone say amen. 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 Continue to bless us, we pray. In Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. Amen.